My name is Anthony Malinchek. Uh, I have a wife named Jenna Malinchek. We've been married for four years, been together for seven years. And we have five beautiful children that also attend Faith Church with us. And I grew up with my, my, my grandparents here in Lafayette on the North End my whole life. Uh, my mom, she, she struggled with addictions as well as most of us out here. And it was challenging at times growing up and not having a dad and only having a mom part time and learning about Christ through my grandmother. She loved Jesus every day that she walked, and she she showed uh, her Jesus through times of struggle. She'd break out her Bible and go right into Scripture where 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 it needed to be at the time of whenever there was a struggle. And she let us know God's words, not hers. And during those times, I didn't I didn't understand what God was having for us at that time, and I didn't understand His love. And I thought it was just my grandma. I thought it was a grandma love thing. It was. Oh, this is what grandparents do. And then so then I, I realized when she passed, it was more than just a grandma. It was Jesus. I was troubled in school. They said I had ADHD. They told my mom that they needed to put me on medicine. So she went out and got a doctor's appointment set up, and I was placed on Adderall at eight years old. And they started me off me at five milligrams at eight years old. And by the time I was 19, I was ascribed to 90 milligrams of Adderall a day. And I was maybe 110 pounds. My body was rejecting in all different ways, was rejecting in anger and violence and rage. At times, didn't understand why. My thoughts were cloudy. I couldn't, I, I'd have night tears. Of, of murder, hate, violence, things that didn't make sense. And then when you wake up, like, what did I do? Was it really a dream or was I, did I really just do that? When I hit about 28 years old, they cut me completely off of everything. Just dry turkey, didn't, didn't give me a chance, didn't do nothing. So I went to street drugs, went to meth that was similar to Adderall. And shortly I found out it was destroying my family badly, really badly. It was going against God's, God's grace. But the addiction was so real for me that I struggled with it daily. It was tearing me apart physically and mentally. And my family got to witness that. And I just couldn't take it no more. I was ready to end my life. I was ready to to be done. I couldn't do it no more. I just, I, I couldn't bear to watch my wife suffer, my kids suffer because of my addictions. So I got down on my knees and I prayed. Cause I know that's what my grandma always said is if you're in a struggle, get on your knees and pray, boy. That's what Jesus would want you to do, just pray. So I got down on my knees and I prayed with my wife right in her lap. This is kind of hard, like I've never told no one. Since since I've been sober, you're the first that's actually truly heard my, like I've told little bits, but this is the most in depth I've told anybody. And it's, it's, it's real. It's, the struggle is real. This is why I'm doing this today, because I really want people to know Jesus is the one that did this for me. Nobody else could have done this, nobody tried. I went to counseling. I went to, I tried everything. I've, today, I don't, I don't do nothing. I, I love on Jesus, and that's my new addiction, is loving on Jesus. And if that's the addiction I have to face the Father with, well, I guess that's one addiction I'm willing to face the Father with, because the other addictions, I can't do it. And I, I'm not going to go back to something I've been familiar with my whole life for something I have now that's apparent, that's true. And, and apparent, like, Peter was it where he's where God told Peter to put your sword down that we don't have to we don't have to fight that's why I tell all my friends around me we don't have to fight this battle no more we have one that fights it for us and I get to show my children this I get to show my wife this and and when this flesh tries to act up and wants to war up I have to go back in my in my mind and know where my heart sits and says hey look the spirit says hey you 
can't do this. Let the mind know. Tell the mind. And the mind says, hey, flesh, stop. So I stop. I don't let this flesh do what it wants to do. Amen. Well, thank you, worship team, for helping us to come before the throne of grace and to bring our praises to the Lord. So appreciate the way our worship team helps us to worship every single week. I thank uh, all of our video staff as well for preparing that testimony. Wasn't that a marvelous testimony about the power of Christ to break the chains of sin? Just what a wonderful testimony to the grace of God that story is. Well, it's a privilege for me to be with you this morning. For those who may not know me, I'm Trey Garner. I have the privilege of serving here at Faith as the pastor of our children's ministries. I'm also one of the worship service pastors here at the 8 o'clock service. And I realize some of you may say, Trey who? Uh, I know, uh, unfortunately, some of my other responsibilities that I've taken on in recent weeks have prevented me from being involved in this service. And I've dearly missed the opportunity to get some time with our 8 is great family. But I'm glad for the chance that I've got to spend some time with you this morning. I want to begin our time together by asking you a question. Do you think that the gospel should impact the way that we relate to our government? Should the gospel impact the way that we relate to our government? In other words, if there was a group of people where half were followers of Christ and the other half were not, and they were talking about politics or they were talking about some of our local, state, or national leaders, should there be a difference in the way Christians are speaking in that conversation regarding their tone, regarding their attitude, the content of their speech. Should there be a difference there? Or if we evaluated their behavior towards the government and its laws and its policies, where half of the group that we were studying was Christians, the other half was not, should there be a difference in terms of our behavioral choices? And would it be a cause for alarm if there wasn't a difference? And I realize that there's quite a few challenges that come with this area. I mean, for example, there's just the character of political debate in this nation, especially around election time. Of course, with cable news, it seems like when one election ends, the next election is already started. And the nature of the way that some of our government leaders speak to and about one another, well, sometimes that's hard to respect, isn't it? Regardless of what political party you may prefer. And then there's the issue of the decisions that our government leaders sometimes make. I mean, I'm sure we could get a pretty good debate going this morning about mask mandates or whether the government should have the power to close down restaurants or businesses or even churches. I mean, if I just said the phrase, the way our government has handled the pandemic, that would probably lead to a pretty spirited debate, sometimes among people who can barely get themselves to work on time. But to hear them tell it, oh my goodness, if they'd been in charge, nobody would have died. The economy wouldn't have been affected at all. Hospitals and healthcare workers, they'd be safe and doing well. But that government, oh my, did they ever mess things up. Or we could talk about the way the government spends our money. You know, in the providence of God, I had the privilege of preparing this message on September the 15th. And I realize some of you may say, Yeah, so what's the big deal about that? Well, that tells me that you're not self-employed, but pastors are self-employed, at least for the purposes of Social Security, which means that we pay our taxes on a quarterly basis. It also means that we pay both sides of the Social Security tax, whereas most people pay half and their employer pays the other half. For pastors, 13.5% of our salary comes right off the top with no possible deductions at all, and that is before we talk about federal, state, or local taxes, which we also pay quarterly. That means that days like September the 15th, that that requires us to send a fairly good-sized chunk of money to the government. And when you see the way that the government sometimes spends those funds, it can make you scratch your head. And when you sit down with a financial planner who says to you, hey, by the time you retire, the Social Security fund will probably be depleted, so you better not count on receiving anything back from that. Statements like that, they can put you in a bad mood. They can. And we could talk about the key decisions that our government and our Supreme Court has made We're talking about the best civic and legal minds in the country. Decisions like 
the three-fifths compromise made at the Constitutional Convention way back in 1787, which determined that African-American citizens should only be counted as three-fifths of a person when determining the population of a state and the number of representatives that state would have in Congress. I mean, incredible, right? Or what about the terrible scourge of abortion? Since Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973, an estimated 61 million infants have been killed in their mother's womb. In a country of 330 million people, that is an astounding percentage. And our government allows that. Now, I would encourage all of us to be deep in prayer over everything surrounding the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg this past week. Our government's got some decisions to make about the way it's going to fill her position and those decisions, they could have a significant impact on our country, not just in the days, weeks, and months ahead, but for decades to come. So please be praying for that entire process. But we could give examples like this all morning long on, on why it is hard to relate well to our government. But that brings us back to our central question. Should the gospel of Jesus Christ impact the way we relate to this all-important area of our lives? And if so, how? With that in mind, please open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 13. Romans, chapter 13. Our church's theme this year is celebrating God's truth. Although no one would have known it last November when we were putting this series together, the last six months or so, they've been a real test of where we're going to find our comfort our answers, our direction. Your chosen epistemology, your source of truth, that's always an important issue, but when the pressure's on, the importance of getting that right, your source of truth right, that increases exponentially. The challenge is, a fair amount of what God's word has to say about life and godliness, it just has a way of cutting against our grains, doesn't it? It's like the Lord explained through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55, where he said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And when you tie that together with our annual theme, that means we're sometimes, perhaps even often, called to celebrate that with which we may not naturally agree or may not like. But that's the church's job. According to Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. In Christ. And when you step back and you ask yourself, from a process perspective, how does that actually happen? The, offer, the, the answer is oftentimes, it happens with a whole lot of sparks, because God's word is grinding away those aspects of our character that are not like his son. And we have to decide, are we willing to celebrate that? Can we stand with the psalmist and say, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul observes them. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth wide and panted for I longed for your commandments Turn to me and be gracious to me after your manner with those who love your name. Establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. May your face, make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. So when you put all of this together, you ask yourself, can you celebrate God's truth even when what he's saying about a particular area in your life is dramatically different than what you think or what you like or what you might desire? And one area of life where that principle is particularly put to the test is how followers of Christ respond to our governments. With that in mind, let's read this important chapter, Romans chapter 13. We'll begin in verse 1. Here's what the Apostle Paul says to the church at Rome. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do 
Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it's a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. We're talking this morning about relating properly to government. And with the time that we have remaining, I'd like for us to think about three civic duties of every follower of Jesus Christ. The first duty is this. You need to be an obedient citizen. Now, how many of you just love the word obedience? I mean, you just woke up this morning and you were thinking, I really want to obey somebody today. And I hope, I really hope it's somebody from the government. Were you thinking that when you got out of bed this morning? I mean, were the first words that came out of your mouth when you began talking something like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, I will obey right away? Or was it something else? Isn't it amazing? We could contact all of the living mothers of every person in this room and they would all answer that question the exact same way. And that just tells us something about the fundamental problem of our hearts. The fundamental problem wasn't whatever the law or the rule we were being given was. The issue was the rebellious nature of the human heart. Thankfully, the gospel calls us to something different and empowers us to be something different. Why, according to these verses? Well, it's because the government is God's instrument of authority. Romans 13.1 says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. So, we are to be in subjection to the government. And please don't say, well, I will be, as long as my guy wins in November. Oh, no, 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 that is not how this works. Our church was planted in 1964. We've been ministering here in Lafayette for 56 years now. And during that time, this country has had 10 different presidents. Six Republicans, four Democrats. Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. And our church has tried to obey this passage of Scripture regardless of who was president. Now, sometimes, admittedly, it's been easier than other times. And, and by the way, if Hillary Clinton were president of the United States right now instead of Donald Trump we'd be having this exact same message. Here's something else to chew on. I mean, let's just say that Hillary Clinton was the president of our country right now. It would have been very interesting to watch the way that we would have responded to any lockdown measures that she would have tried to enact related to COVID-19. I mean, I honestly wonder what kind of citizens would we have been had she been president? Now, lest any of that give you heartburn, what do you think of the presidents I just named or of either one of the two candidates running for the presidency in this upcoming election? You realize that we're being asked, that what we're being asked to obey, that was not even in the same league as what the Roman church was being asked to do when this letter was originally written. I mean, we don't know anything about that level of challenge. And yet the principle, it just could not be any clearer. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing, governing authorities. And I would encourage each of us to, to make a commitment in our hearts right now that whoever wins this election in November, that you're going to determine to follow this principle. 
Lord, if it's Joe Biden, help me to be an obedient citizen. Lord, if it's Donald Trump for another four years, help me to be an obedient citizen. And that would be true on a local and state level as well. And the reason is given in the very next phrase. It's because all authority is from the Lord. Verse 1 goes on. It, it, it says, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. I mean, it just couldn't be any clearer than that. And you might say, well, how in the world could the Lord allow some people to gain a position of authority in our world or our state or our community? Well, that goes back to Isaiah 55, doesn't it? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In some cases, it may harken back to the principle that we learned way back in Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed. Why did the Lord allow Israel's very first king to be a disobedient, rebellious, jealous man like King Saul? Well, that goes back to the well-known saying, be careful what you wish for, because sometimes in his judgment, the Lord may give you what you want. Remember another haunting phrase from Romans chapter 1. God gave them up. God gave them up over you never want to find yourself at the end of that phrase let me just say this about that if you don't have a place for the wrath of god in your working theology of life i honestly wonder how you make sense of everything that's going on in our world today but these principles about the sovereignty of god they can bring peace they can bring comfort to our troubled hearts they also bring a challenge it's because disobedience to government is disobedience to the Lord. Romans 13, 2 says that, Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. This is why there absolutely ought to be a profound difference in the way followers of Christ respond to our government compared to those who don't yet know the Lord. And a good question for each of us to ask would be, is that difference apparent in the way that i conduct myself am i factoring the sovereignty of god into the choices that i'm making and would that be evident to the people around me would there have to be changes that i should make in the days ahead so that that would be truer of me paul goes on to say the government is god's instrument of judgment verses three and four for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior but for evil you want to have no fear of no fear of authority well do what is good and you will have praise from the same for it is a minister of god to you for good you know it does not bother me at all when i'm driving down the road and a police officer is driving behind me when i'm doing the speed limit that doesn't bother me at all now i'll let you decide whether you want to complete the rest of that thought but government is an instrument of judgment against ill conduct Verse 4 goes on to say, but if you do what is evil, be afraid. The government's job is not to make everyone feel comfortable and happy. That's not its job. The best way to stay on the right side of the law is to keep the law. And please, please don't miss this detail. It bears the sword. Verse 4 goes on, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it's a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Does everyone here understand the purpose of a sword and what it does? The relevance of this passage to where we live right now, it's absolutely breathtaking. And yes, every police officer will stand before God someday for the way that he or she exercised this authority. And anyone who misuses his or her power should be held to the same level of accountability. But let's be very clear about this. The biggest problem in this country is not abusive policing it's a lawless citizenry and before you start thinking oh yeah there are some people out there they are really bad let's be very clear it's not just people out there that we're talking about we're also talking about the people in here we need to recognize that the propensity for lawlessness exists in every human heart including yours and mine but if you are adopting a philosophy of social justice that feeds the rebellion that exists in the human heart, I have to tell you, you've adopted a false gospel. 
you may very well end up promoting rebellion and lawlessness. You could put others in a position where they're less likely to come to Christ as the only true way to deal with the rebellious sin that resides in all of our hearts. That's one of the reasons why this verse-by-verse study in the book of Romans has been so important for us. Do you really believe in the doctrine of the total depravity of man? You cannot study the first three chapters of this book and come to any other conclusion. And that's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is mankind's only hope. It is only in and through Jesus that we could possibly respond to imperfect government in a way that would honor the Lord. This passage also teaches that the government is an instrument of service. Verses 6 and 7 say, For because of this you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. The government, it serves as servants of God as well as servants of man. Now, thankfully, we live in a participatory democracy. So there's nothing wrong with us reminding our officials from time to time from where their authority is derived. But I can't withhold my quarterly tax payment this week because I don't like something that the government has done. Matthew twenty two twenty one. Then Jesus said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. By the way, this is why we have worked so hard to collaborate with our state and local officials on our COVID-19 response. I mean, we should be very thankful for our state and local leaders. Governor Holcomb said very early on that churches were essential services. We never even had to close our offices if we didn't want to. He allowed churches to return very early with very few restrictions. Dr. Adler at the Tippecanoe County Health Department, he's been very accommodating. They approved our church family night plan for the Tippecanoe County Amphitheater last Sunday night. And we've done everything possible to submit to the health department's authority, including limiting the number of tickets that we made available for that event. But I would just pause, and I would ask every person here, how are you doing at celebrating God's truth on this particular issue? And are there changes that you need to make both in the inner and outer person to come more in line with what God's word has to say about this matter? Also, are you committed to continuing to obey this passage, regardless of who wins this upcoming election? Or if the election ends in a tie, which is a possibility, by the way, and the House of Representatives then has to decide who the next president would be. Are you willing to commit to continuing to obey this passage even then? Also, I I realize that we would have a number of people who attend our church, particularly at our West Campus, who would be citizens of a different country. Your situation may be far more difficult, far more challenging than any one of us from this country could begin to understand. But if we believe that God's word applies to all people, then we have to understand that God's word is sufficient for any country in the world. And I would say this, if you find yourself really struggling here, could I just ask, is that possibly a sign that you don't yet know Christ? I mean, remember how this passage began in the key transition back in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where it said, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. If you've not yet experienced the mercies of God, it'll be impossible for you to be this kind of citizen, at least in the way that's drawing on God's power to achieve God's purposes. Now, this passage goes on to affirm that we're not only to be obedient citizens, but you also need to be a loving citizen. And it is amazing how the Apostle Paul builds on the issue of owing our taxes. I mean, it's almost as if he says, hey, you think that's a significant debt? Listen to this one. The real debt we owe is to love our neighbors. And one of the questions that we have to answer when we cross the line from verse 7 into verse 8 is, are we still talking about the way that we relate to government, or or is this an entirely different subject? And we can't be dogmatic on that, but we set up this message the way that we did because there's no doubt that what would help our government, and any government, 
would be citizens who genuinely choose to love one another. This is one of the reasons why we're trying to be very careful during this pandemic. I know that people are getting very tired of wearing masks and social distancing and hand sanitizer and all of the restrictions, but, but let's not forget the fact that for a segment of our population, this virus can be absolutely deadly. Lest anyone want to roll their eyes on that one, we need to remember that we've had two members of this church die due to COVID-19 this year. There's also the issue of making a statement to our healthcare workers who continue to put their lives on the line every day. And then there's all the educators who are taking on significant risk to do in-person instruction. Then there's the business owners who are teetering on, the, teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Regrettably, some of our local businesses have had to close down this year. So the most loving thing that we can do is to be as cautious as we possibly can be. We faced this last Sunday night when we were holding our church family night. You know, it, Pastor Byers mentioned um, regarding our church family night to all of the folks who attended that when we were planning what we were going to do in September, we assumed that we would have to have our church family night virtually in September. But at our August meeting of our pastors and deacons, some of the guys suggested that we tried to hold that service outdoors. So we had about three weeks to put that together. One of the very first steps that we took was to contact the county health department. And they've been great to work with. We've been trying to submit ourselves to them. So, so we came up with a plan that used about half of the available seating in that amphitheater. So we made about 800 tickets available for that event. Uh, and, and that's more than we would normally have in attendance in one of our church family nights. So, so we thought we were fine with 800 tickets. Well, sure enough, on Saturday afternoon, we learned that we had reached that 800 ticket limit. So we had to decide what we were going to do. Were we going to keep the, the agreement that we had made with the Tippecanoe County Health Department and, and restrict access beyond those 800 tickets? Or are we going to just tell everybody, come on out? Well, I think you know what we decided to do. We decided to keep that agreement and we stopped distributing tickets. Well, it wasn't long before we started receiving text messages late Saturday night saying, hey, I'm trying to get tickets for church family night. It says the event is closed. And that's the challenge in distributing free tickets. You can never predict how many no-shows you're going to have for an event. And you can see by this picture, we probably could have safely seated about 50 to 100 people more. And sure enough, we talked to some of our church members this past week who told us that they tried to get tickets they weren't able to. We feel terrible about that. But friends, our government needs the people of God and everyone else to remain vigilant in all of this. And at some point, at some point, it's always come down to whether we're willing to sacrifice ourselves in order to love our neighbors. And it's always wise to err on the side of love. You know, it may not surprise you with uh, the various ideas and groups who have been vocal about their opinions during this pandemic that at one point there was a Christian group that asked us to get behind an effort to deem the governor's lockdown orders to be unconstitutional. And we had to decide whether we were going to get on board with that. Now, put yourself in the position of Governor Holcomb. I mean, he's hearing it from all different sides, right? He's got this group coming after him, that group coming after him, and he's trying to help our state navigate this pandemic. And he's walking a fine line where he's got to balance public health and personal liberty. He's walking a tightrope. I think the last thing that he needs is the people of God who say they believe passages like Romans chapter 13 to be opposing him on a variety of issues. Paul goes on to say that the fulfillment of the law is to love our neighbors. Romans 13, 8 through 10 says, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbors as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now please remember where we are in the book of Romans. We're certainly not saying that a person is saved by keeping the law. That's not what we're saying. That would contradict everything that we studied in the early chapters of this book. But once you have admitted your sin 
and repented and placed your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as your only hope of heaven. Once your sin is forgiven and Christ's righteousness has been placed on your account, and now that your union with Christ is in place, that frees you to keep God's law. That's why Romans 6, 17, and 18 say, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That's where that testimony from Anthony earlier comes in. Being freed from sin and now a slave to righteousness. Let me give you a practical example of this. Right now, you are sitting in an auditorium that's about 34 years old. Our church began using this space in 1986. And aside from knocking down four walls to give us a little more seating and addressing some aesthetic elements, this space is pretty much the same as it was in 1986. The same cannot be said of the size of our church family. Our church family is about six times the size it was in 1986. And many of you would know this story well, but there came a time about 15, 16 years ago when we had to decide if we were going to build a new auditorium to accommodate the growth of our church. Now, that was a decision that came with a $9 million price tag. Now, that may not sound like a lot of money to some of you today, but back then, 15, 16 years ago, that was a lot of money to some of us. The challenge was, if you invested that money in the construction of a new auditorium, a space that would primarily serve ourselves, you'd be tying up those funds in a building that would sit vacant six days out of the week. And if you know anything about the heart of our church family, then you know that we want to use our facilities to minister to people as much as we possibly can. My goodness, we'd use them 24-7 if we could. So we had to decide between two different options. Option one was invest in a new auditorium to serve ourselves. Option two, look for creative ways to accommodate the growth of our church by adding additional services in our current auditorium and in other spaces and use the funds that we would have used for an auditorium to love our neighbors. Those were the choices. Now, I think you know which one we decided to go with, option two. And I believe that was a key decision in the history of our church, because that decision led us to survey our neighbors, to learn how we might best serve them, which in turn led to the construction of the Faith East Community Center. And in many ways, That decision set us on a ministry path that led to the start of Vision of Hope, Faith West, Faith Community Development Corporation, the Hartford Hub, Restoration Men's Ministry, the North End Community Center, on and on and on. And just think about all of the souls that we've had the opportunity to impact through those various ministries. That decision opened the door for ministering the gospel to people that we might never have had if we had built that auditorium. And incidentally, that decision, that has served us well during this pandemic when it's been much more valuable to have a variety of spaces in which to hold smaller socially distanced services rather than a mass gathering in one big room. And it's all because the Lord led our church family to be more concerned about loving our neighbors than loving ourselves. And I want to commend you for being the kind of people who take the Lord's command to love our neighbors seriously. In fact, I'd encourage you, While the weather is still nice, go out and take some walks in some of the neighborhoods surrounding our church. There may be some of our neighbors who are out taking walks as well. Get to know some of them. And then as you get to know them, casually ask them if there are ways that our church could love them right now. Maybe by raking their leaves this fall or shoveling their driveways this winter. Our country needs citizens who are committed to loving each other right now. Of course, that's always been the case, and it always will be. This passage tells us that that you need to be an obedient citizen. You need to be a loving citizen. It also tells us you need to be a godly citizen. It tells us that we're supposed to lay aside the deeds of darkness. Romans 13, 11 through 12 says, Do this knowing the time. That's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night's almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. According to this passage, it is the civic duty of every Christian to grow in personal holiness. And as we take the opportunity to love the people that God's placed around us, as we build those relationships with our our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, 
they need to be able to recognize that there's something different about our lives, something that's appealing and winsome. And that simply won't happen if we are engaged in deeds of darkness. If we complain about this pandemic or if we denigrate our leaders, if we take out our frustration on our spouses and our kids, if we slough off at work, if we devote all kinds of time to private sin, you probably heard it said that if you want to make a difference in the world, you have to be different from the world. And for the Christian, that means consistently making choices about the way that you conduct yourself, both in public and in private, that are designed to bring honor to the Lord. Of course, we understand that not only do we have to lay aside the deeds of darkness, but we also have to put on the Lord Jesus. Verses 13 and 14 say, let us behave properly as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. And something else that, that I love about this picture is that, that we had people there from each of our campuses. And, and if you remember, last Sunday night, oh my goodness, the weather was beautiful, was it not? It was gorgeous. There are so many different ways that our church family could have used that evening. But the people who joined us at the amphitheater, the people who joined us online, they chose to devote that evening to praising the name of the Lord Jesus. You know what that's called? That's called making no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. That's what that's called. Now, you and I, we're going to have all kinds of opportunities this coming week to choose how we're going to spend our time how we're going to use our speech, how we're going to think about and relate to our government and its leaders. I want to encourage all of us, through the power of Christ, to be obedient citizens, to be loving citizens, to be godly citizens. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this very practical passage of Scripture. Thank you for just cutting it straight with us, Lord, and telling us that the authority that has been established that authority comes from you. And you call us to recognize that if we choose to disobey that authority, we're disobeying the God who gave us that authority. And Lord, we don't want to do that. As followers of Christ, we ask that you would help us to be committed to obeying the authority that you've placed in front of us. And Lord, we also ask that for the people you've placed in our lives, would you help us to be people who love those that you've given to us, whether those would be members of our church family or fellow members of our community. Would you look, help us to look for creative ways that we can love and serve those? And Lord, would you help us to be people who are committed to personal growth, to holiness, to uplifting your name in our conduct so that those with whom we interact would have reason to question what the difference is in our lives? Would you help us to be people who are committed to living by the word. We ask all of this in the marvelous name of your son, Jesus. Amen.